for me to come out and speak to Tea Party gatherings because, uh, you know, essentially Tea Party is the, the real conservative uh, movement in America. It used to be that, you know, Republicanism was uh, ubiquitous. If you're Republican, you're Republican, you're Republican. But the reality is, is now it's not quite that simple. And so um, when I meet with my Tea Party uh, compatriots, like you all here, good folks, it's, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure and a delight. I don't have to so much guard or mince my words. I was, uh, I was at the California Federated Republican Women, a huge event in Sacramento a couple months ago. I invited my wife and my daughter to come out and accompany me there, and I was a keynote speaker. And, and, um, and so I started talking about you know, the state of republicanism and what's happening in D.C. And I start, started throwing out labels like idiots and buffoons and things like that. <laughs> and so my, my wife and daughter, they were like shocked. They were like, so at the end of it, they said, you know, um, do you really need to call people names like that? And I said, well, I, you know, I, I said, you know, I, I thought about it and I thought about it overnight. And then I came back to them the next day. I said, you know what? If if I can't use those terms, the only other terms I know, I'd be literally cursing and people would be, you know, I mean, because, you know, those are nice terms in my opinion. But so I, I, I promised them, they said, well, can you just, you know, so I promised my wife and daughter, I said, okay, look, I'm going to go out, I'm going to have this conversation tonight, and I promise I will not call Boehner a buffoon, I will not call, you know, you know, uh, you know, the, these guys, you know, uh, uh, you know, Boehner and McConnell and these guys, I won't call them idiots and buffoons, and so I'm going to pledge to you, I am not going to call those guys buffoons and idiots. <laughs> Or I did already. Oh, well, whatever. I mean, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'll be nice tonight. But see, as, as a Tea Party uh, advocate or an activist, this is the kind of language, But because all of us are good-natured people, and we're looking for terms that we can use that would be acceptable in a public forum. Now, if we're really in our heart of hearts, what terms would you use for these guys other than, than those? Those are probably the nicest terms you would use. Other than that, you'd be in the other category and you'd be using curse words. And I don't want to do that and I don't want to offend anybody. So, so anyway, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to be amongst family and friends and fellow patriots where we could, uh, you know, get to know each other and, and begin to parse uh, some of these things that I'm all about. Um, and, and from my perspective, I'd love to just... Uh, get you more acquainted with who I am, with who the Frederick Douglass of uh, uh, Frederick Douglass Foundation of California is, and what we do. Um, and then my latest book, which is actually a free PDF download and audio, so you can do that for free if you want. Um, but I think you will find, because of the richness and texture of the book, that this is a book that even if you downloaded it for free, you are going to want hard copy because you are going to want to pass this to multiple of your friends and family. So I have multiple books here. Just fresh off the press, this is the first uh, meeting that I'm doing since having the book. I just, I just finished re writing it in, uh, I guess, early March. And uh, got my first stash, and, and here I am. So I want to thank you again. Thank you, Colleen, for, for working with me for the past six months, trying to get me here and clear schedules and all of that. And it worked out that I could be here tonight. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about, uh, I'll, I'll go back history, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Frederick Douglass, who he was, um, what he did, and why he's important to the Republican Party. A lot of people may not know that whole story. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of that. And then I'll go into justice. I mean, fundamentally, we in the Tea Party are people committed to justice. That, if we were to try to narrow down, crystallize, distill what we fundamentally are all about, we're about justice. And the reason why we evolved or we emerged or we, or we became an actual party, a, a mindset and a movement, not a party, big P party, but a, a movement, is because we saw that our own liberties and justice was being eroded, not under this black president, but under Bush. It was his profligate spending at the end of his second term that really drove us to look at how do we organize against you know, this kind of spending? Because the more our government spends, the more it's going to enslave our children and grandchildren. And that's how the Tea Party came about. It never was about race. I mean, these are, you know, comfortable, lib, media type taglines that they want to try to use. But we know what we're all about, and it has nothing to do with that. If we came in under the Bush administration, then surely that's a, that's a false narrative. But uh, nevertheless, it's painted out there, and um, 
and we need better ways to articulate what we really, really are all about. This book uh, is called Just, Justly, Justice. Purposely, um, you know, a tongue twister. Just, justly justice. And so what I'm trying to say is there's only one legitimate, definable distinction for justice. And it is not social justice, racial justice, human rights, war on women, um, you know, income uh, equality. It's not those things. It has nothing to do. Those things have nothing to do with what real justice is. And what you'll find if you read this book, it goes into it, and I'll t talk a little bit more about this at the end because that, it all ties in, but what you'll find is that um, justice is really a biblical, historical definition. And it's something that we all, it, it, it's innate, it's a part, it's an innate part, it's an innate part of our human ontology. It's, 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 it's something we all yearn for and uh, we should all stand up for. But regrettably, because we haven't defined it, um, we've allowed the liberal side to define what it is and what it isn't. <clears throat> we, most times we kowtow, we don't want to you know, really stand up for what justice really is and call them on their crap. Social justice is, and I wrote right in, in the book, social justice is demonic. And I don't have to defend it here. I, I go through a whole workshop and I show clearly how that's so. So you don't, you know. But this is something that, and, and, but I, you do get a picture of how that works in the book. But anyway, uh, so I have the books and I have uh, Frederick Douglass shirts um, that we can, we can talk about, and those are only 15 bucks, and I have Frederick Douglass memberships. Now, this is what we do at the Frederick Douglass Foundation. We do the hardest part of going into communities of color and trying to get them to understand and accept the fact that they are conservatives. So that thing that Reagan was talking about is 1977 CPAC where he says, look, you know, majority of people are on our side. They just don't know. That's what we do. So we at the Frederick Douglass Foundation, we, we use your membership dollars, we go into these communities and we, we try to get these, you know, we have uh, pastors' breakfasts and these types of things. We get mostly cur clergy because in communities of color, uh, the clergy are really still sort of the community leaders. We start there and we start to educate these folks on what, what, what conservatism really is all about. And we hold them accountable, or we try to hold them accountable to helping to convey to the, the folks, the parishioners, the truth. And so that's what we do. Uh, we're also policy advocates, but we're actually evolving, we're emerging into political strategists. So, you know, I'm, I'm working on Donnelly campaign. I'm his faith, uh, his faith person and also fundraising, but uh, <clears throat> we're getting more into political strategy and uh, we have a, a huge network of, of community uh, leaders and, uh, you know, within res their respective community that we can overlay on any campaign and actually get a win. So uh, we're getting moving more into that too. And, and you as a Frederick Douglass Foundation member, you'll have access to some of those, you know, some of those types of conversations and the people that I bring out. So we've had multiple fundraisers. We brought out Alan West and we spent a full day with Alan West at my house. We had a couple hundred people there. Uh, we've had Rand Paul, he spent uh, two days with us. You know, he, he spent overnight with me and my family. You know, he and his, his wife Kelly, his son Robert, uh, we had a great time with Rand Paul. Uh, so he's a good personal friend of mine. Alan's a good personal friend of mine. We had Tim Scott there for a full day. These are exclusive opportunities for Frederick Douglass members. Frederick Douglass members. Membership's only 35 bucks. Uh, I, I know some folks here from several years ago who actually joined back at that time. It was $100 at that time. We lowered it to 35 bucks. We want to uh, allow most people, we want to take away any, any reason for not joining us and helping us in this cause. So it's $35 to become a member. And again, when I bring these people out, Dr. Carson's the next one that we're hoping to get out in October. Uh, so y you get exclusive, you, you'll know when they're coming, you'll, you'll be first in line to, to get in and, and do that. So typically these things I have in my house. Did anybody come to my house? Uh, anybody here? No, okay. So we're in the Hayward Hills and it's a, it's a nice picturesque place. We can hold you know, a few hundred people at a time. And these are you know, very nice events that we can, we can do. So if you become a member, you can, you, you, we can do this together. So anyway, um, so we'll talk about that at the end. But I wanted to just give you a little bit of perspective on who Frederick Douglass was. There's still a lot of people that don't know. And the reason why they don't know is, is in, in my opinion, is because he said something uh, quite poignant and astute. He said, I'm a black, dyed in the wool Republican because it is the only party 
of freedom and progress. That's a Frederick Douglass quote. And that's one of his most important quotes, especially for Republicans. Um, but you know that doesn't play well with liberals. Now, this is a gentleman who was a quintessential American patriot and hero. He is beyond reproach, literally on both sides. So the liberals love him, but they won't do a movie about him. They won't spend any time talking about him because he was, he was emphatic. And, you know, some people could probably try to say, well, you know, he was probably, once he escaped slavery and all of that, he was just, you know, with his relationship with Abe Lincoln, he became a Republican. He was a Republican from day one. He really wasn't. He was actually, and I'll get into this in the story, but he was actually uh, uh, sort of helped by Northern Democrats. And they fully, uh, they, they, you know, they didn't fully, but they, they, they did uh, sort of um, do some brainwashing on him about what Democrat and Democrats were actually good and this kind of thing. But when he met Lincoln, Lincoln actually held his feet to the fire and told him that he needed to read the Declaration and Constitution for himself. And that was the difference. After he read those documents, including the three-fifths clause, he was absolutely clear and he became a Republican, an ardent, strident, fully constitutional Republican, unapologetic. And so, and on that note, you know, some people say, especially my liberal friends, well, you know, uh, why didn't he stand up for the brothers and get us, a, you know, 40 acres of the mule? Well, because he could have. He was, he was not only in the Abraham Lincoln's inner circle, but he was in four other Republican presidents' inner circle right after Lincoln. So he was in the inner circle, in the Oval Office, at the strategy table with some of our most important presidents in the 1800, in 1800s. But the reason why he didn't do that is he, another famous quote that liberals don't like is he says, give the Negro nothing except fair play. Those that want to be helped up will be helped up. Those that don't want, let them stay there. So he was not about redistribution in any way, shape, or form. For him, it was clear that there's two caliber, there's two kinds of people, which is what we see now, and we paid tax day yesterday and, and with the stats coming out today, there's two kinds of people. There's people that want to survive on the government uh, teat, so to speak, and then there's people that want to go out and try to make their own way. Well, Frederick Douglass knew that as an, as an escaped slave and, and his slave homes that he participated in because many times when he tried to escape, it was the other Negro slaves with him that would go and tell the master in the wee hours, Freddie's going to leave tomorrow. So, what he, and so that happened a few times. He says, well, what's going on? I thought everybody wanted to be free. But literally what he, dis, what he found out at, at that stage was not everybody wants to be free. There are some that are very comfortable having those three square meals and being chained to the master's table. And then there are some that really want to make their way. And so that's why he said, give the Negro nothing. It, it wasn't a, he wasn't trying to offend anybody, but he was saying, matter of fact, there are some... We want to give the dignity of hard work and, and self-preservation and the ability to make our own way. And there are some that really covet that. And then clearly there are some that would rather just, you know, just as long as I can have my squeeze three square meals, I don't care if I'm chained to the master's table, that's good enough for me. That's existence. And so that was why, that's the context of that. Of that. He wasn't trying to be harsh or cruel. But it was being matter of fact that we have two different kinds of people. Now, what we have in America today is the exact same thing. Um, we have 86 million of us who will work, pay taxes, and all those types of things. And we have 146 million who are on the government dole in some way, shape, or form. That just, that just came out today in CNS News. You can get that, you know, if you go to CNS, you get that, that article. So we have almost a two-to-one split of those who are working and productive and have the dignity of work and commitment to work, and we have those that are now 143, 146 million. So it's that same split. It's not, it's not class necessarily anymore. It's not, hey, you know, I'm lower middle class, you know, that, that whole Marxist uh, thing that he gave us with all the different classes. Literally have people that want to work and make their own way, and we have people that don't. So that's, that's what we're fighting today. But I'll tell you a little bit more about Frederick Douglass. So 
Uh, Frederick Douglass was born into slavery, so it wasn't like he was born and then captured. And he was he was born a slave. So his mother was a slave. She uh, you know she she got raped. It was fairly common at the time, and he didn't apologize for that. It was just one of those things that happened fairly frequently at the time. So he was a mixed race slave because his mother was raped by a, a white slave master, and so he's the product of that. So. Um, he was born into slavery, never really knew his mom, but he was raised by his grandmother, which was really a communal, because right when you were born into that, they, they sign up, sort of ship your mother away and take you out of that anyway, so there's no real close but blood ties there, and they have like a mother who, a grandmother type who takes care of, uh, you know, all the little ones, you know, could be 10, 15, 20 at a time. Well, he was one of those, and it was his actual grandmother that was taking care of him. But, um, and then by the time he was six or seven, he actually got shipped to his first slave home because he, you know, he needed to know when you can actually start slaving, you, you need to sort of be in that home and be comfortable with slaving. So <laughs> I know it's a weird term in today's terms, you know, for, for us to think about in, that, in those ways, but that's, that's kind of how it was. So a seven-year-old is shipped into a home and his first slave home was actually fortuitous for him because these people had never had a slave before. They actually got him because they wanted him to just be a, a, a playmate to little Tommy. So, you know, you had little Freddie and little Tommy and they were, you know, the, the, the slave owners wanted him to just be a playmate to little Tommy, they were the same age. So um, the mother of the house actually started teaching Tommy to read and brought up little Freddie, she said, well, you know, so taught them both to read at around the same time. Well, the slave master comes home and he says, what are you doing? And she says, well, I'm teaching Tommy, I'm teaching Freddie to read. What do you mean what I'm doing? And he says, well, you can't teach a slave to read. You can't, no, you have to stop that right now. And she says, what, why? And this is all in the presence of the boys. So Frederick Douglass heard this. He says, well, if you teach a slave to read, he'll, he'll, he'll be free. He, he can actually become free. So, so, you know, one of the things that they were trying to do at the time, and they're still trying to do today, um, we at the Frederick Douglass Foundation, we say they're, we're the 21st century abolitionists. Because what they're still trying to do today is if we can keep people fat, dumb, and ignorant. I don't mean that in any derogatory term. I mean, I get the analogy I'm trying to paint here. If we can just keep them sort of buttered up and just in our good graces, um, and, and they're ignorant about what's really happening, um, then you know, they'll, we'll keep them in bondage to our party or to our philosophy or whatever. So the same thing happens today. So he heard that and that really, really struck him because she said she stopped from there on teaching to read. But when he heard that, he says, well, I can actually become free on my own. He says, I can just go down. I'll sneak down every night. So he did. He snuck down into the, the, the den or the library and he would take a Bible off the shelf and he felt that it was God himself teaching them to read. So he learned how to read through tutelage of Holy Spirit, God, and whatever, and he was learning to read this way. And he became a proficient reader and a great orator. So he was also a teacher. He became a teacher, a Sunday school teacher for all of the slaves on Sunday. So even at a very, very young age, he was teaching other slaves how to read. They'd have to do it in secret, but also teaching them about the Bible and stuff like that. Essentially, by the time he was in his late teens, I think he was probably 18 or 19, he actually escaped. And he went, he escaped, went up to New York first. Then they started capturing slaves as far north as New York. And so he went further up to Boston. Well, when he went up to Boston, there were some great northern slave, or nor, northern Democrat abolitionists. They weren't really abolitionists, but they were northern Democrats who weren't really for the slave thing. And they, you know, they, they took him in. Because the real abolitionists were Republicans, but these people were really sworn Democrats, but they were, they didn't really believe in slavery. So they took him in and they helped him perfect his craft as public speaking and, and writing, because he was a great prolific writer as well. And uh, then they started to reclaim slaves as far north as, as Boston. They said, look, if you have any slaves, we're gonna you know, go around and we're gonna start rounding them up, taking them back south. So uh, what they did is they arranged for him to be a, a guest now, this is the mid-1800s. We have a black escaped slave that becomes a guest of the UK. So for two and a half years, the people in England, now this was after Wilberforce and all of that, so I mean there was a certain amount of reformation going on about slavery and that kind of thing in the UK at the time. But the point is, is they kept this black man as an honored guest of the country for two and a half years. 
uh, uh, then uh, his, the, the folks who did bring him up north to the Boston area uh, realized that they can actually buy his freedom. So they bought it and then they told him to come on back to, to the United States. Immediately when he came back, he started a newspaper. And it was a North Star newspaper. And so, just to give you an example of how successful the newspaper was, at the time of his death, in the late 1800s, he was worth approximately $30 million in today's dollars. It was a black, you know, self-made man. In today's dollars, his estate is worth approximately 30, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 million bucks. So he was, he was no slouch, he was very well respected. So because of his, 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 um, his sort of, um, his, uh, his, his, his legacy sort of preceded him, he had the opportune time to go to an Abraham Lincoln event. And Lincoln was up speaking, or he was in there, and, and you know, Frederick Douglass comes up to one of the side doors and say, hey, can I get some time with the president? And we're like, what are you kidding me? You're, you're black, you're probably a slave. What are you talking about, you know? And he says, well, just tell him Frederick Douglass is here. And so the Secret Service guys went to Lincoln, and he says, you know, we got this guy. He's black. No doubt he's a slave. You want us to capture him. But he says he wants some time with you. His name is Frederick Douglass, you know. And Abraham, he got excited. Abraham Lincoln got excited. Oh, bring, bring him in. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know him. I read his you know, read newspaper, and he's a, bring him in. Because he was written, he was well-written and well-spoken at the time. He was, you know, he was well-known. So he brought him into the table and told him that he was up to Emancipation Proclamation. Well, when Frederick Douglass, you know, heard about Emancipation Proclamation and, and Lincoln says, yeah, we're going to take it through Congress and this and that, and Douglass said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. You cannot take this through Congress. He says, you know, if you do that, we're going to have two, maybe three generations more of me, people like me, they're going to be killed, maimed, lynched, whatever. Hundreds of thousands of us will die. He said, this is the most important executive order that you can ever do, you or any other president can ever do. And you're the president, this is your plan, just do it via executive order. Well, to this date, it is the most important executive order that any president in history has ever done. Because Abraham Lincoln took Frederick Douglass' ab admonition and said, yeah, okay, we'll do it through executive order, and did it. <laughs> yeah, so at that time, obviously, the Dems pretty much ran Congress and Senate, so there was no way that it was really going to get done, but Lincoln was thinking, hey, you know, we'll do it a few times and ultimately maybe in the next 50, 100 years, and, and, and Douglas told him rightly, you know, it's just too many people will die. So, um, so that's, the, that's sort of the, the long and short of the story. A couple more things about Douglas and his character. Uh, I told you that he was, he, he was of mixed race. He, he actually did marry a black ex-slave as well, woman, and they had a couple of children, two girls, I believe, or two or three girls. And, um, and then she died. She died of cancer. And then he married a white woman. So even though he was whipped within an inch of his life, even though he endured some of the worst conditions that we, could, we can't even imagine what he had to endure uh, during those times and how many times he got caught, reclaimed, and whipped with, you know, just completely devastated on his body, um, he, he still had in his heart redemption, forgiveness, because he went and he married a white lady and took her as his wife. So, you know, this is, this is the quintessential American story about horrible conditions, the worst conditions that anybody could probably imagine short of Jesus himself. I mean, he came up at a time that was just horrendous. Um, becomes a self-made man uh, where he could have had a lot of hatred against whites. He embraced them, ultimately in the end marrying one. So that's why I say Frederick Douglass is the quintessential American hero. We should also know that Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln were the first generation Tea Partiers. <laughs> No, I mean, no, no, really. Now, we, you know, we didn't have fiscatory tax policy at the time. There were some taxes, but they weren't confiscatory like we have right now. Right now, it's just it's a matter of just a grab for big government. But back then, they did have taxes. But these, these gentlemen, they were, they were strict constitutionalists. And, and uh, they believed in fiscal restraint, small government. Everything that we believe in today and that we fight for is Tea Partiers. So they were the Tea Party movement of their day. 
They were absolutely Republicans, but to them it was one and the same back in the 1800s. You can be, have a Tea Party mindset and a Republican at the same time. Now today we're being fought against. I'll move into what's happening today. So today we have people who would um, run, uh, so I, I've started with, uh, let me tell you this story. So I started with talking about at Confederated Republican Women and, talk, and I talked about the divisions that we have within our party and I said, we're fooling ourselves if we think we're a united party. And we're, and we're being not realistic if we actually think that we're all, because we're Republican, we all you know, march to the same beat, we don't. There are clearly some within our party that hate us. And I don't mean that with any uh, type of uh, vitriolic uh, explanation. I mean, literally, they would rather see a liberal win than a Tea Partier. Uh, and, and, and so that, you know, a perfect example. Carl Rove was here in Sacramento just last week. Buffoon. Yeah, buffoon. <laughs> you said it, I didn't. I just, I just echoed what you said. <laughs> so uh, he was in, he was in uh, Sacramento last week and he says, look, um, we're going to, you know, we're going to lose the gu gubernatorial anyway, but it's better to lose with Neil Kashkari than Tim Donnelly. I mean, how insanely idiotic is this man? No, really. I mean, but, th but that just shows you there's a clear shift in mindset between establishment types and Tea Party. And, and they, are, they are really conspiring against us. Now, this is the idiotic part of the GOP. The Tea Party itself is only a mindset and a movement. It is not an actual party, with, even a party within a party. It's not a party. It's a mindset. Now, what is the mindset? The mindset is, look, you know, we're taxed enough already. Enough already. We're, we're taxed enough already. Enough already. That's our mindset. I mean, so every, every Republican, you know, and I've, I've asked them this. So when I go to Republican events, I says, you know, how many Tea Partiers we have in here? We got, you know, three quarters of the room raising hand. I says, so how many Republican, you know, true Republicans we have in here? Everybody raise their hand, of course. And I say, so what troubles me is that we within our own party don't understand our own idiocy. Because, you know, the reality is, is, I, and then I ask the question, so how many are just tired of taxes? We're tired, you're taxed enough. Everybody raises their hand. I said, so see, you're all Tea Partiers. Because the Tea Party is not a literal party. You don't have to register and have card. The Tea Party is a mindset and a movement, but yet we're castigated and demonized as if we're doing something unscrupulous to the party platform. We're standing for what every GOP -er should be standing for. But clearly there's a division within the party and we're kidding ourselves if we think that these people don't mean us harm. They go out and recruit a Neil Cash Carey. Now, Donald Lee was, you know, after A dropped out, Donald Lee was the only guy standing on the Republican side. But that wasn't good enough for the establishment types. They go out and they recruit a guy who has a track record that is it's horrendous as far as conservatism. I mean, it's horrible. Cash Carey is the guy who did all of the Bush tarps. I mean, you guys know that. I mean, he did the he did the Bush bailouts and the Bush tarps. Cash Carey did, and and he has no family, and he is he believes in every single thing that Jerry Brown believes in socially. So it's like you really are a Republican in name only. Yet. When I was at this event, they were trying to say, no, we're going to get rid of, don't, don't, don't use Rhino anymore because it divides the party. No, there, it's an actual distinction. It doesn't have to be derogatory. There are literally people that you can put that label on and they would probably agree. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm really a lib, but you know, I'm, I'll run on this ticket just so I can you know, kind of shake up uh, the Republican side and take some votes. There are literally people like that and that label is not going away because it's a fact. We do have people within our party that are rhinos. It doesn't have to be derogatory. That's, uh, what are you gonna call them? I mean, you know, they're Republican and they, they believe everything the other side believes. Uh, what else are we gonna call them? I mean, you know, other than buffoons, idiots, and all the other stuff. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, 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 you know, the point is, is that we cannot kid ourselves about the tasks that we have in front of us. And our task is fundamentally to stand for righteousness and justice. This is what Abe Lincoln 
and Frederick Douglass did for. They just wanted a just government and a just people. And um, so I wrote this book, Just, Justly Justice. And this is the connection point. Um, we have been demonized and maligned in a lot of different ways. When we just try to stand up for what we, we think common sense. It's like, where are these people coming from? We just, everybody believes that we're taxing up. Even they just did a poll yesterday. 60, 60 plus percent of all Californians believe that we're taxing up already. So I wrote Donnelly last night. I sent him the, the article and I wrote, I says, look, you, you know, 60% are, are with us. They're tea partiers. They don't know it, but they are. I mean, that's what we stand for. That's the definition. But we have to get smarter about how we talk about what we are. So when people try to say, well, you're a racist. Wait, wait, wait. Do you, do you think you're paying enough taxes? Well, yeah, I mean, okay, thanks for joining the Tea Party. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I mean, come on, we're making, it more, we're making it much more difficult than it is. This is a mindset. It's a movement with, with a particular mindset. And all it's saying is, we need to put the brakes on government spending. We're taxed enough already. That's all. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's simple. It's a simple concept. But we allow, and then we get defensive when, you know, and then we're trying to defend when the media, you know, try to come at us different ways and we try to defend what we, it's very simple. When we get uh, interviewed, we say, look, uh, Mr. Uh, interviewer, are you, how you feel? You, 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 you pay, must pay a lot of taxes because you make a lot of money, right? Oh yeah, so you, you tax enough already? You, I mean, you, you want to pay a lot more? Well, no, of course not. Well, thank you for joining. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that, it's that simple. I mean, why, why, why can't we do that? We, we, but we allow these caricatures to stick to us as if they mean something. And we know we're being demonized by the other side and it is playing in certain communities. That people really believe that about our, about our mindset. So we have to be astute about how we talk about it. Now, the other way that we have to be astute is talk about justice. So you're a social justice advocate, right? And they say, yeah, well, of course, yeah, you know, especially liberals. I know we, we're not because we, this, is, this is horrible. But, um, and, and by the way, this book goes through social justice, racial justice, human rights, all of them, breaks them down, defines them, clarifies it, so we know exactly what we're talking about. A lot of the issues that we run into, too, is we're just not astute. We don't know how to message. We don't know how to bring people on board. So when we talk to our liberal friends or our family and family, they say, look, I'm, I'm really for social justice. The reason why I vote the way I vote is because, you know, I think that the Democrats care for the poor. Oh, I say, okay, good. I have a whole section here about care for the poor. And Colleen's read the whole book. But, and so uh, this gives you all of your talking points. I mean, literally where they will, you will shut them up and have them on defense. They will have to find, they will have to contort reality in some crazy way to try to, and it would have to be illogical for them to defend their position. But we, right now, we don't have the tools to have the argument. This book is what does it for us. It tells us what justice really is. And so what I'm, I'm gonna tell you what it is, because what I've done is in this book is, I, uh, I got so tired of hearing, you know, these social justice pastors and liberal clergy and all these people and then, then talk about the poor and then war on women, all this crap that we get fed all the time. And it's, you know, and um, so I, you know, I got tired of hearing all these things and uh, that's not, you know, and we have guys like Boehner and, and, and um, you know, McConnell and these other guys and Cantor, they can't, they don't know how to talk. They're marble mouth. They don't know how to talk, right? They don't know how to say anything to... They're not defending the party. They don't defend anything. It's like these guys, they're, I mean, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the B word. What we'll say that again? Buffoons. Buffoons, yeah. Okay, he said it. <laughs> so, so, uh, so anyway, so what, we, what I was realizing is that a lot of times we don't even know what our, we don't even know, the reason why we don't have a comeback or we don't know how to defend what we really mean is because we don't really know historically, biblically, and otherwise what the actual term is. So what I do in this is I define justice and I define it by going to the websites uh, for social justice, human rights, and racial justice, and I get their actual definition, their actual definition. So these are their terms. And I distill it into a single principle, their terms into a single principle. 
And do you know what, it, we know what justice really is? It's actually what our founding fathers and our forefathers had already written in our documents and both the Declaration and Constitution. So if it has to be one word, do you know what it is? Equality, equality comes from, uh, yes, equality in that, but it's not quite equality. It's not, no. What is that, if we had to define justice into a single distinction? Liberty. No. I'll tell you what it is. It's the, it's the, it's, it is the equal right, but it's the equal right to exist for all mankind. That's what justice, according to social justice advocates, according to human rights advocates, according to racial justice, it's the equal right to merely exist. This is profound. So when you look at the Declaration, the first, uh, the preamble to the Declaration, the first thing you think, all man's created, and, and uh, you know, life is the first thing, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And then when you look at the um, Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments, where we talk about no man should be deprived of, you know, uh, life, liberty, or property without due process, these types of things, right? So our forefathers had it right. But we don't, we don't, we, you know, we don't get into that. So what this does, is this, and, and you got to read it, and I hope Co Colleen will, uh, will attest to it. Was it a good read? Yeah, it good. All right. So uh, it's only 130 pages or so. It gives you, let me sh show you some of the things that I cover. I'm just spending a little bit more time on this because this is, now surely you can go to the website and have your friends and family just download it off the website. It's free, and it will always be free because this message is too important for me to try to capitalize on and make 10 bucks a shot. This is, this is important. This could save the country if we can all embody it, understand what we're talking about. So it's free in PDF and audio. So you can get this on a website. But the reality is if we tell our friends and family about it, chances are they're not going to download it. So I've got hard copies here for us. So we can buy multiple copies and start handing this stuff out. But I, I want to tell you what it covers in the, in the uh, ninth chapter. So, um, starts with, uh, these are the, the various justice causes, and I give them a grade. I give you the current um, context of it, and I give you a grade. Caring for the poor. Now, I break that thing way down and talk about what that is. I talk about it biblically. I talk about it historically. I, you have all the ammunition to, 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 to address this issue and show your liberal friends that literally the most compassionate way to deal with the poor is how conservatives or Tea Partiers or Republicans would deal with it. It's the most, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, it's, it, it's unequivocal. When you see it, it's like, oh my God, that's, that's a fact, it's true. Then um, I talk about uh, liberal progressive clergy. So black liberation theology, liberation theology, go through that, right? And, and about what that's really all about. And I call it what it is. It's demonic, it's evil. And then, but I, I don't just call it that as an author. I give you why, biblically and all of that. So I give you all the ammunition you need so you can, you know, and then war on women. I tear that thing up. I mean, you know, there is, you know when, you, when you read this book, there's no justification for, because what, what, I just, what we clarify in this book is that the GOP side, whether you're conservative, Tea Party, Libertarian, the GOP side is actually in the war for women. It's the liberals that actually are precipitating the war on women. And it's literal and unequivocal, and especially if you read this, and you would be able to articulate it to any of your liberal friends as to why. And you say, look, this is, you know, this is what it is. So um, then I go into uh, social racial justice uh, agencies and social and racial justice and what, that, uh, what that's all about. Then immigration reform. I talk about immigration reform in a way that uh, our, let's just say, <laughs> buffoonish, idiotic type. I'm not going to name names. I just, in general, a general characterization. Um, it's, it's easy for them to say, it would have been easy for them to say over these past four, five, six years, um, we're actually harming the people on our border 
These people are looking for a better life. And, you know, quite honestly, folks, I tell you like I tell everybody else, if I were in Mexico right now and, and you know, I would, you know, it's open borders. So surely I would try to make that trek. What we don't talk about is the fact that our DOJ has provided the human and drug traffickers over 2,000 assault rifles to maim and kill these people that are just looking for a better life. And yet, they're espoused as the ones that are compassionate. What you don't know, and this is a fact that the GOP talking heads should be saying from, from rooftops, and they should have been saying four or five years ago when this whole thing happened with Fast and Furious, is that 10,000 people a year are maimed and killed on our borders, on the southern border, trying to get here for a better life. They're maimed and killed. La Raza, quiet, silent. Nobody talks about the, the, the lives that are being harmed, the human atrocities. It's indefensible. And guess what? The blood is on our hands, on all of our hands, because we as a country allow this. I give you the analogy that I give in the book. If you had a swimming pool, you went down and you pulled, pulled papers at your local uh, county office, and you say, look, I want to put a pool in the backyard. And they say, okay, fine. Here's the specs. Okay, now this is how you have to make sure that it's fenced. It's, it's throughout California and throughout most states, it's a requirement. You get a pool these days, you must fence it. It's not debatable. The reason why you must fence it is because you have a neighbor next door who may have a small son and they want to make a swim. Let's say you didn't. Let's say you fence it just to get your permit signed, but you and your family, you swim on a Friday night, you take off that Saturday morning, you come back that Saturday evening, but you forgot to put the fence up because it's a hassle. It takes 15 minutes to put the thing up. And your neighbor and his son is floating in your pool. Uh, guess who's going to jail? You can't say it was them that wanted to come and swim on my property. That is not a justification. You are going to jail, and you're probably going to get second-degree manslaughter. You're going to do time. You're going to pay restitution to that family you are going to have a record, a felony, because you, because, and uh, what, the, what the city will say is, we told you, it's a law, you have to put the fence up, because you induced your neighbors to come here. It's an inducement. You seduced them to come over and take a swim. So it's your responsibility, you're responsible for these dead people in your, in your backyard. So how is that different? Now, would somebody please tell me, how is that different in our border? It's the exact same thing. The exact same thing. So these people are being maimed, killed, raped in the most horrible ways to get here, to try to be with their family and have a better life. And we're not doing our first duty, which is to take away the inducement and make it a deterrent. Put up a fence. It's no big deal. Just put up a fence or, or use some, you know, we can use some drones to, however we need to secure it, but we need to secure it. It's a human rights atrocity that's happening right under our feet because of this administration. And we have the GOP. Oh, well, let's, let's give them all amnesty. Is it? Just completely idiotic. This is not compassion, folks. This is we are putting people in harm's way. And the, the, the Dems are doing it, knowing it, and they're saying, look, you know, um, you know, that's just the price of, you know, getting, getting new political pawns here. We got to kind of, this is the price you pay. You know, bringing the sheep to slaughter. And nobody's speaking about this. So what I do is I tear that down in here and other things. So we give you, uh, you know, essentially in this book, you get all the talking points. It's thirteen ninety nine. So I'm hopeful that if you, you know, have any questions about it, I'll take a few questions now. But I'm hopeful that everybody will grab one or two or a few because this is the kind of document that could really begin to change some people's lives. It could change, and I, you know, I would, I would suggest that you actually buy a few to send to your people, people who are running for office. I've given it to a couple of people who I know personally who are running. This is literally, this is their platform on social issues, on all the issues, on how to debate, on all these issues that they're going to hit, get hit with. This is it. This is, I, I lay it out, and it, right? So, um, so I'd encourage you to do that.
I'd encourage you to become a member of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Again, we've got a lot of people that we're bringing through. Uh, we do all the time, and uh, I know Hayward is a little bit of a trek from here, but it's worth it. If you can meet Rand Paul and really spend, you know, half day with him. Uh, again, Alan West will probably get him back. Uh, he's, he's not in politics at the moment, but he'll probably be appointed at some point. Um, and um, I don't know if Tim Scott's coming. He's, he's, he's got to win his stuff. But, but we, you know, and then we got Ben Carson coming, uh, hopefully. We're still trying to work out that logistics for that late September, October. But yeah, yeah, we'll take some questions. Go ahead. Do you have those events? How much does it go today? It varies. So, um, first of all, I'm quite honest with, with these guys. A lot of them want, you know, well, can you, can you raise 25, 50,000? And I'm honest with them. I say, look, we got a we got a fantastic place. I got a 10,000 square foot home. It's it's huge. It's beautiful. I mean, it's you see, got all three bridges right at the top of the hill. It's it's great. But I tell them, I said, I have a nice venue for you, but I don't know people that's going to write $500,000 checks. But what we what what I will put you in touch with are the grassroots people that can get you, you know, I can get you some county. Um, organizers and, and people that work at the grassroots level who can get you elected or have you win, help you to win your district or help you to win California if you plan on running as a president. But that's the extent of my network. I don't, even though I know some people with my, I don't know enough people that'll pay $500,000, $2,000 to, to see a guy. So when I bring them out, I'm pretty honest with them and I say, look, you know, we'll, we we'll may be able to get you, you know, I can get 200, maybe 300 people in here for you, and it's going to be, you know, 100, 150, something like that, and you walk away with whatever you get. It's, and so that, that works fine. I mean, as long as I'm up front with them as to what we think we can do, I'm, you know, this is my community here, you guys. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't deal with the, the hobnob with, with the people like that, and I prefer not to. This is, this is who I am. This is where I'm most comfortable. So, um, so it, it varies, but it could be, if it's a Rand Paul coming back, it'll probably be a couple hundred dollars. If it's, if it's Ben Carson, it's probably 150, 200, because he has, a, he has a big nut we have to put up front to get him here. I mean, he's not, he's not inexpensive. He is expensive, minimum. And that's just for a 45 minute talk. I mean, he's way, he's very expensive. Now for him, because he's not officially announced, he's not, we're trying, not trying to fundraise, it's just a speaker's fee. And I have to go through a speaker's bureau for him, so it, it's, it's not cheap. But it won't be 500, 1,000, nothing like that. It's, it's always in a $100, $200 range, so uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah? Uh, our core values are fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. In a word, liberty or freedom. Yep. Frederick Douglass spent his whole life and he achieved, and, and he was very successful in working for and achieving liberty and freedom That's right. for black people. Right. Today, we live in a society where the government is increasingly enslaving all of us. Right, right, exactly. And it is making us dependent on it. It is ratcheting tighter and tighter and tighter to control us in every which way. What are your goals and uh, where do you Good, good, good question. So, um, as a Frederick Douglass, you're speaking. What are my goals as the president and chairman of Frederick Douglass Foundation? Okay. So, as the president, uh, as the Frederick Douglass Foundation chairman and president, my goal, our goal, is to again reach out to communities of color. Now, we, we we reach out to tea parties and, and other communities as well. But we think that we can expand the tent, not in the ways that we kowtow, we acquiesce, we you know, subvert our core values like the rhino Republicans want to do, the establishment types want to do by giving amnesty and all the freebies out. We do it in a way that we help people connect with the fact that you, you are conservative. You don't know it. Like Reagan said, you, you know, we have a lot of people out there just don't know but we need to provide them with an avenue. We need to provide them with a vehicle, with a, with a person that does really fully represent their values. Now, if we acquiesce on core issues like life, marriage, redefin redefining marriage, and those things, although there are some in the GOP says, hey, we expand the tent and all this, the reality is, is I have no conversation for the people that I normally meet with if that happens. 
because they're going to say, and, and as a liberal, ex-liberal, uh, I was born and raised in Hunters Point in San Francisco, fully indoctrinated in liberalism most of my life, uh, went to San Jose State, have a sociology degree, so I, I got the liberal thing down pat to a T. So there's nothing that, so that's why we're so comfortable going to those communities because we, we've been there. I mean, you know, we, 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 and we know all of the, all of, not only the lingual, but we know all of the crap they're going to try to give us and we could just give it right back and say, cut it, cut the crap. We're not, you know, that doesn't fly because I know, I know exactly where you are. I was, you know, all that stuff. So we can talk them through it. But the point is, is that, um, we focus on going into those communities and helping those communities to come, become more conservative. Um, we have pastor's forums and pastor's breakfasts in order to do that. Um, our biggest thing, let me give you a, a real startling stat that should trouble all of us. Um, the stat is, and this was in um, Investor's Business Daily about a year ago. Uh, they said, yes, we, you know, the GOP can kowtow on immigration, amnesty. If we do that, at best, we'll get a 6% bump from Hispanics who would, who would say, okay, uh, at best, we'll get a 6%. The majority of that is going to, to the liberal side. Um, they said, if we were smart as GOP, we'd go to people of faith. And because, you know, this is the stat that all of us should be aware of and get on our pastors to get to work. Of people of faith, only 50% are registered. Only 50%. And of the 50% that are registered, only 50% of those vote on any given election. So we're leaving 75% of our brothers and sisters in the Lord on the sidelines. They're, they're, we literally, as people of faith, can take over America if we just do our part. Amen. Amen. Okay, we, just, we just need to do our part. God's given us the land. Like, you know, I you know, would imagine, you know, with, with the guys going into, uh, you know, into Canaan, he says, look, I gave you the land. You got to go in and fight, but the land is yours. Well, he's given us America. We, I mean, we have to sign up people and, and help them to know the truth. But it's ours. I mean, if literally, if, if we had people of faith voting in mass, 80, 90 percent, I don't care how much media Brown or Hillary or anybody else would have. I don't care how much uh, fraud is in there. It, it, they would not be able to withstand the numbers, the pure numbers, if we had people of faith vote, uh, register to vote, and then vote not. Uh, we, won't, we don't want them to vote their values. We want them to vote biblical values. So we first get them to vote, to register to vote. And then we say, uh, by the way, your values may be a little bit different than God's values, so just read that before you go and vote and vote God. So I started the Vote God movement right before the last election. And that was our primary message. I was just going about churches and, and I said, look, we're allowing labels to define us. And the labels right now are being used against us. We're hurting ourselves. We're killing ourselves, spiritually and otherwise, because of labels. What we need to do is get rid of the labels and just vote God for people of faith. Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm making some broad assumptions here. I'm assuming most people here are people of faith. But if I'm not, you can sort of just filter it. But for people of faith, if we just do that, we can win. Yeah. I just want to say, though, that a lot of people are standoffish toward the Tea Party because they think it is a faith-based movement, and we exclude a lot of people from it. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so what you tell them is... Yeah. That was my first question when I came to the meeting is, is this a religious group? Right. I am a person of faith, but I want to belong to a movement right. that's open to everybody, and right. not just people of faith. Right, so what I tell people all the time who have asked me questions about, well, how are you, you know, a brother, and you in the Tea Party? I say, look... Uh, how are your taxes? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> we we got to keep it simple. I mean, we got to always, you know how you ask the question many different ways. We got to just keep it that simple. It's, that's what it's all about. It's about nothing else. Nothing else matters. We don't have any. We're saying vote God. Right, right. This, right. So that vote God is for me with my particular movement. It's not the Tea Party. It's not associated with Tea Party. That's something I started. Yeah. yeah. That's something I started. 
Um, as the Vote God movement, Vote God 2012 was, a, and I still got websites out and, and videos out there. But, and so if we are in the Tea Party and we are people of faith, the whole point is, is that we use our churches and our pastors and we, we tell them about these stats and we just say, look, can we have a few Sundays where we just register voters? We don't, we're not saying take sides. And then when we get close to the election, can you just please just encourage people to just vote God? So this is a message for that particular community. Not for everybody here to just go out and say, okay, we're just going to all vote for God. That's not, that's not what I meant. So, but thank you for, yeah, yeah. I'm a numbers guy. I'm on hard data points and, and that helps me fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. mm. You've been at this for a while. I, you know, we talk about yep. the society and all that kind of stuff. What are the numbers? What's the numbers? What, how have you measured your impact? say, I'm being successful in what I'm doing, or I wasn't, and now I've modified it, and now I am a how did, how did you... That's a good question. Thank you for that. So, um, we, it's hard for, because, you know, when we get the pastors in the room, they all, you know, glad hand, and they, they you, know, you know, we're with you. When they go back to their churches, I have no, you know, I don't go to all these other churches, to their churches to see how that's being rolled out or whether they'll take a firm stand when it's time to, to get people to vote. Uh, chances are they'll probably revert back. So I'm not real clear on how much of an impact we're making. I do know, but you know, so what I rely on, what we rely on is some people sow the seed, some people water the seed, and God gets the increase. So I may not be able to, we may not be able to quantify that, yes, we turned them all and they're all voting now because we don't have the manpower to go and manage that and monitor that that way. But we do um, give them an alternative and we help them to see that there, there's a better way that they can be utilizing their vote. Um, but because of that, we're still going to do that, or our outreach that way, but what we've also done is we've shifted to being political strategists. So, so for national um, people who want to run for president, uh, like Rand, for instance, if he wanted a, a California uh, chairperson or, mul or multiple chairperson, we could be one of the organizations that he would partner with. And we can deliver, I mean, I have 80 plus um, community chairs that we can overlay on a Rand Paul campaign tomorrow and, and really proliferate throughout the state. I mean, Rand, in my opinion, is the only um, GOPer that can literally can actually win and send shockwaves in America, can actually win California. In my opinion, Rand Paul. And the reason why I say it, now, I, I, I met Cruz, I love him. I love Cruz, I love Rand, good, good guys, met them both. Rand's a personal friend of mine. Cruz, I've met a couple of times, nice guy. But a Cruz type of conservatism for California, you've got one faction that'll come out for Cruz. That's your diehard conservative Tea Party. Libertarians think he's a neocon. Black community and Hispanic community thinks that he's completely against you know, other races. So the factions start to break down very, very quickly. College, they'll stay away from him. Um, you know, Silicon Valley stay away from Rand with his libertarian conservative streak. You got colleges, young people, blacks, uh, Hispanics, potentially. Um, you've got uh, Liberty, uh, Tea Party, diehard GOP. You got the whole thing. Rand is, you know, and, and so you got something for everybody. So we could deliver a Rand campaign here in California, and that's the kind of thing that we're moving into. Yeah. Yep. I'm standing ovation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the the kids, but so so when we start talking about basic principles for these factions, well, Rand talked about was NSA. He says, you know, you 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 go call your sweetheart, you know, and how many people in here got a cell phone? They raise their cell phone. Okay, call your sweetheart. Guess what? That's being monitored. You may not want to do that. I mean, that resonates very quickly with that community. It's like, what, what do you mean? Yeah, well, the NSA, and he goes and explains everything, and then that's really intrusive, and for people who are committed to liberty, it's, it's unacceptable. So even our youngs, we can get with, with Rand. Uh, I'll, I'll take you, Marjorie, and then I'll go over here. Okay, how do I renew my membership in the Frederick Justice 
just fill out another app and I have a card reader. We can do a check or money or credit card, however you want to do it. I've got all the apps there and back and I'll, I'll get you some right here. Yep. Yes, yes, sir. Um, I'm sure you can't measure uh, the, the positive effects of what you do, but I'm also sure that we're much better off if you're doing what you do than you have. Right, exactly, exactly. And the other question I have is, uh, a friend of mine's father was a native of Chicago, and he voted Republican his entire life, and ever since he died, he's been voting Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. My point is, is there any natural recognition of the corruption that's going on in all the uh, um, you know, I think the true to vote, these types of initiatives are the things that we can, we can do. Uh, there were some stats that came out two weeks ago, I think two and a half weeks ago. I think Breitbart had a few columns on it. But, you know, the registered voters in Ohio for the whole state is, or there were multiple states. There were like five or six states that the registered voter was actually, you know, 10, 15 percent higher than the population. So, I mean, this is rampant stuff. But and, there's life after this. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, and so what we need to do is we need to have, uh, I'm going to use Colleen's term, we need to have cojones to stand up. <laughs> to, st to stand up. That's Colleen's term, I, you know. But to stand up when they say, well, the Tea Party's against, you know, uh, because you want, every, you, you want to disenfranchise the voters with no ID. And so, therefore, you're racist. We need to have the cojones to have this conversation. And we say, look, this is, this is a fact. And I've, I've documented that in there, too, as you'll see. But this is a fact. You need an ID for a prescription. You need an ID for Obamacare. You need an ID for Obamacare. I don't know if you know that, but everybody needs an ID. You know, they ask you your social security, you know, whatever. You need an ID to go see a doctor. You need an ID to go cash a check. You need an ID to, to buy alcohol, to buy cigarettes, to get on, to go into a federal building. So what I tell people is, look, you need an ID to go in a federal building. You need an ID for TSA, which is a federal agency. You need an ID for uh, Obamacare. Then what you're telling me is that our president's racist. A, a rabid racist is what you're telling me. I mean, because that's, it's, 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 isn't that, the, by definition, that's what they're saying. They're saying, well, you're a racist because you think that we all need the IDs. You say, okay, if that's your definition, then this is what you have. So, I mean, that, but that's not a hard argument. Why can't these so-called leaders, right, and the GOP just articulate as simple as, this should have been articulated years ago when Holder and Obama started this stuff, and we would have put them on a defense. Right. Because it's in the, you, can't, you can't even try to argue around it. Once we get that up on the table and say that, the case closed. What are they going to keep you going? But we haven't made the argument. We haven't messaged. We got a bunch of mealy mouthed, spineless, feckless. I can't say enough about these guys. Uh, but we have these guys, and they, they don't know how to message. It's horror. I mean, we got, the, we got the most horrendous representation probably we've ever had as a party in the history of our party. These guys are completely worthless. And I'm sorry if you're uh, a real Abaney, uh, you know, here, here's the thing. I'll apologize in advance for not being able to apologize at all. Because, you know, if you're a real Boehner guy and, and McCain and, and Graham and, you know, these guys, McConnell, uh, you, you're really in the wrong, <laughs> this is a party for people who like liberty. These guys, they're, they're, they're just one, they're, they're just as bad, you know, as far as cronyism and plutocrats and, and all of that as, as the other side. So that's just a fact. So anyway, so what we need to just be smart about, and the, the, this book does provide you with those simple things. Somebody talks about voter IDs, just tell them that. Well, that means you're, you're actually literally calling me, even though you're liberal, you're calling me, you're telling me that our president is a rabid racist because he's asking for IDs to go into federal buildings and TSA and all these other things, right? By definition, that's what they're saying. So we need to be able to be better at that. Okay, anybody else? What you got? I would really, really appreciate anybody and everybody if you can join the majority. Uh, so here's, here's what our, the Frederick Douglass Foundation is. Here's our model. We're the largest multi-ethnic, Christ-centered, Republican or conservative ministry in America. And people say, well, ministry, what do you mean? And we say, look, um, Jesus came to set the captive free. 
That's what we're doing. We're trying to set the captive free. We still have folks that are in bondage. You know, they're enslaved to ideology. And we're just trying to set them free. That's, that's our model. So uh, we, would, we would appreciate it. The majority of our members are Tea Partiers. So, you know, for, for what it's worth, you, you're, you're in good company. Uh, and you'll get, you know, multiple things. you get newsletters and you get invitations to these things. And there is a discount uh, as being a member. So uh, at these various venues when we have these people come out. So you'll, you'll get that as well. Any other questions? Yeah, David, yes. What's the number for the Society? Foundation? Foundation. I only make that distinction because there is a society. Nice. It's too different. Nice. Nice. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so what's the number? Yeah, how many members? Right now we got about 150, 160. We're the uh, largest chapter of Frederick Douglass, and now we have 23 chapters across the United States. So we got, and we're the largest chapter in California. I've been at this for um, about four years now, for Frederick Douglass. You know, I just started this chapter four years ago. We've got about 160 people. And that's because you know people fall off and they forget to renew, and but it stays around that pretty much, and um, and so that's that. One last thing about the book: uh, $15 or two for 25. And uh, Frederick Douglass shirts, $15. If you want any shirts, uh, you know, what a, what a, you know, go to one of your liberal events, they know your tea party, and then you show up with a Frederick Douglass shirt. <laughs> it's, it's the absolute, it, it's $15. And, and, and so it's the absolute best thing that you can do. It, it says, um, love, loved or hated, never ignored. It was one of his, uh, uh, one of his statements. And it's, it's Frederick Douglass. So you, you know, they, they, so you show up and you, you have this stuff on and you're going around your liberal friends and they say, oh, that's that racist TV. What are you talking about? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, a diehard Frederick Douglass fan. I'm a member of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Uh, you know, what are you, you know, so we need to be better at putting the other side on defense. Uh, we haven't done a good job at that. Most of that hasn't been done because we have some national leaders that are clueless. You know, I don't want to get into it. Uh, but um, I want to thank you so much. I'll be at my table. I have, you know, card readers and everything over there if you want to join or sign or any of that. And we can talk then. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.